Hello and welcome to another Common Core Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we're going to be doing Unit 2 lesson number 1 on Introduction to Functions. There is hardly any concept in math that is more important or more fundamental than that of a function. So we're going to begin our discussion today by reviewing just what a function is. Let's go ahead and do that. All right. A function is any rule. Notice how I put rule in quotes because, you know, rule is taken by a lot, as a lot of different things by a lot of different people. But a function is any rule that assigns exactly one output value for each input value. Now, we typically think of the outputs as being y and the inputs as being x. So think of it that way. When I put an x value in, what happens is only one y value comes out. Now, functions come in a lot of different forms, but the three most common are equations, you know, like y equals 5x plus 2, graphs, like this beautiful one, and tables, something like that. Now, because functions are all about converting inputs to outputs, we have special names for them. The input variable is often called the independent variable. In other words, x is just x. It can not exactly be anything it wants to be, but it's sort of independent. Then again, we call the output, the y variable, the dependent variable, because it really doesn't get to choose what it wants to be. You know, when I put x in, then the rule converts that x into a y, and I don't really have any choice about it. The y variable depends on the value of the x variable, typically not the other way around. So let's jump right into a real-world scenario where we have a function. Exercise 1. An internet music service offers a plan whereby users pay a flat monthly fee of $5 and then can download songs for $0.10 cents each. Sounds like a good deal. I like it. Especially if I'm downloading a lot of songs in a month. What are the independent and dependent variables in this scenario? Well, the independent variable, right, is simply the number of downloads, right? That's independent. All it depends on is how much music you want to download. But the dependent is how much we pay or how much we are charged, right? Obviously, the more songs we download, the more we're going to pay. The less songs we download, the less we're going to pay. Letter B. Fill in the table below for a variety of independent values. In other words, how much are we going to have to pay if we don't download anything? How much are we going to have to pay if we download 5 songs, or 10 songs, or 20 songs? Now, you should be able to do this with the information that the problem gave you. So why don't you go ahead and do that? And if you want to use your calculator, that's fine. But why don't you fill out that table, okay? All right, let's go through it. Well, there's not much we have to do for zero downloads, but it is important to note that we are charged something. In other words, we're charged that flat monthly fee, $5. You know, so if we have a bad month, we don't get onto uh, the music service, we don't order anything, well, we're still being charged $5. On the other hand, if we do five downloads, right, think about this, at 10 cents a piece, well, that's going to be 50 cents we're going to have to pay. But then we're going to have to take that 50 cents and add it to the $5 because we are always are charged that $5 and we're going to get 550. We could do the same thing for 10 songs, right? We would have 10 songs times 10 cents. Ooh, that just gives us $1, right? But then we'd have to have that $1 and add $5 to it to get six dollars. We would find the same for 20, that would be seven dollars. Okay, now the reason I like doing something like letter B, even though it's relatively easy, is it's going to lead us to the formula for this function, and keep in mind it really is a function. Right, the definition of a function is that any given input gives us exactly one output. It wasn't like you said, hey, if you downloaded 10 songs, you would be charged $6 or $6.25. It was, no, you download 10 songs, you're charged $6. One input gives you exactly one output. 
Okay, pause the video now and then we'll clear out the text. Okay, here we go. All right, we're going to continue to work on this. Letter C says, let the number of downloads be represented by the variable x and the amount charged be represented by the variable y. Write an equation that models y as a function of x. So we can do mathematical modeling in many different ways, but here we like that formula, right? So think about that for a little bit and look back at b if you need help. All right, well, what did we do? In B, we kept taking 10 cents and multiplying it by the number of songs that we downloaded. But then we kept having to add that to $5 to get our total cost. So there's our equation. Y equals 0 0.10 times X plus five, okay? So we took what we did in letter B and we just turned it into an equation. Letter D, based on the equation you found in part C, produce a graph of this function for all values of x on the interval 0 to 40. Use a calculator table to generate additional coordinate pairs to the ones you found in part B. All right, well, why don't we do it? Let's bring open the TI-84+. plus. There it is. There's not a lot of room on the screen. I apologize for that. I'll try to make the, the calculator screen as big as I can when I need to. But let's, um, let's generate a table of values. Let's hit y equals. All right, if there's any equations in y1, y2, etc., clear them out. So I'm going to get rid of anything I've got in there now. All right, and in y1, I'm going to put that equation. So I'm going to type in 0.10x, don't want to have 10x, plus 5.00. All right, now, sometimes we'll use the graphing calculator to actually graph, you know, like to produce a graph on the screen. But here we're going to use it to create a table. And I think, I think I noticed something. I think there's really nice numbers every 10 songs that we download because songs cost 10 cents a piece. So let's go into our table setup. Remember we do that by hitting second window. Let's start our table at zero and let's go make it go by tens. Now tens, that's kind of cool because that means every 10 downloads I'm going to see something else. All right, let's go into my table. Huh. And look at that. Now you don't have to have your table set up exactly like me or like mine, but it is kind of nice, right? When there were zero downloads, we saw that our Y output was five, 10 downloads, our output was six, 20 downloads, our output was seven, 30 downloads, our output was eight, and 40 downloads, our output was nine. So we can now graph this. You can probably graph it a little bit better than me, but I'll have 0, 5, 10, oh, what are these going by? 50, 6, yeah, they're going by 50 cents each. So at 10, we're at 6, which is right there. At 20, we're at 7, which is right there. 30, we're going to be at $8. A little bit tricky to see, we're right there. And 40, we'll be at $9, all right? I think I'm going to actually try to use the uh, use my line command, and there it is, right? And there's my functions graph. All right. Now, technically, this is actually, if you remember something from Algebra One, this is the case of a discrete variable. So really, I shouldn't be connecting these with a nice solid line because obviously the number of downloads would um, have to be an integer. Would have to be an integer. But sometimes we'll draw a graph as continuous even when it's not because it's too difficult to show the uh, just the dots instead of connected with a nice solid curve. Okay, I'm going to be clearing this out in a moment, getting rid of the TI calculator. So uh, write down what you need to. All right, I'm going to clear it out. Let's get rid of our calculator. It'll be back later. One more time. All right, let's take a look at exercise two. That took us a while to get through exercise one. Exercise two involves something very important in terms of the graphs of relationships, not functions, relationships.
One of the following graphs shows a relationship where y is a function of x and one does not. Letter A says draw the vertical line whose equation is x equals 3 on both graphs. Again, I think that we're going to use our nice line utility on that. Here's x equals 3 on that graph. And here's x equals 3 on that graph. So x equals 3, x equals 3. Letter B says give all output values for each graph at an input of 3. Well, on A, we have an output there, right, because that's at the point 3 comma 4. And we also have an output here, and that's at 3 negative 4. So the outputs are negative 4 and 4. Relationship B, well, there we had 3 comma negative 2, so only negative 2. Now letter C asks us to explain which of these relationships is a function and why. Well, only B. And the reason is because it has only one output for a given input. This leads to what's called the vertical line test. The vertical line test. Um, all students who study functions have heard of this guy, the vertical line test. And the vertical line test is relatively easy. It just says, look, if I draw a vertical line like I did in relationship A, and it hits more than once, then it's not a function. But if it hits only once, then it is a function. All right, the vertical line test. It's helpful. It's helpful to quickly tell whether a graph is the graph of a function or not. All right, pause the video now, write down whatever you need to. Okay, I'm going to clear this out and then we'll move on. Exercise three. The graph of the function y equals x squared minus 4x plus 1 is shown below. State this function's y-intercept. Oh, I bet you can figure this one out. What's its y-intercept? Yeah. The y-intercept is the y-coordinate where we cross the y-axis, and that's at y equals 1. Between what two consecutive integers, consecutive means right in a row, integers, whole numbers, does the larger x-intercept lie? Well, here's an x-intercept, and here's an x-intercept. This is the larger one. So that must lie between 3 and 4. Letter C. Draw the horizontal line, y equals negative 2 on this graph. Let me do that in a different color. There it is. That's y equals negative 2. Great. Using these two graphs, find all values of x that solve the equation below. Oh, remember, when I'm gra solving an equation graphically, and I have this equation graphed, and I have this equation graphed, then all I have to do is come up with the x values, in this case x equals 1, and x equals 3, okay? 1 and 3, where they intersect. Letter E says verify that these values of x's, x are solutions by using the store on your graphing calculator. Well, we could use store, we could use a table, we could use a variety of things, but let me use store since that's what the direction said. Let me open up the TI-84 plus again. Great. Now let me use store. Now how am I going to do this? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to store x equals, or I'm going to store 1 into x. So let's do that. 1, store, x. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to type out the left-hand side of that expression. So watch. x squared minus 4x plus 1. Now I'm going to hit enter. And it tells me negative 2, which tells me it's a solution. I could do the same thing for 3, but I'm not, for x equals 3, but I, I don't think I'm going to. I just wanted to show you how easy it is to use store to check to see if something's the solution to an equation. Very, very simple. Right. Anyhow, I'm going to clear out the text and get rid of the calculator, so pause the video if you need to. 
All right, it's gone. Let's get rid of the calculator. It's gone as well. And let's move on. So in today's lesson, we laid the groundwork for maybe the most important idea in all of mathematics, the idea of a function. Its definition is simple. If I put an input in, there can only be one output out. This has a lot of different ramifications, and one of the things it gives rise to is that vertical line test, right? So use that on the homework to test whether or not graphs are, in fact, graphs of functions. Okay. Um, we're going to see functions a lot this year, so take the homework seriously. Really try to understand them up front, all right, because you'll need them a lot later. For now, let me thank you for joining me for another Common Core Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.